All right. So if you thought I was done jumping around the Bible, I'm not done. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this is our last Sunday in Pride Month. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes we think that Pride is all about marriage equality and about being recognized as what most would consider normal. But the fact is, pride has nothing to do with marriage or with assumptions about heteronormativity. Pride is about our very right to exist as LGBTQIA plus people. 50 years ago, we had no such right. It was a crime to be gay in every state in this country, a situation that persisted in some parts until 2003. When I graduated high school, you could still be arrested in the state of Texas for holding hands with another man. In the 1960s, police raids on gay bars were routine. They had been since the 20s. Prohibition just gave them another excuse. But even in the 60s, they were raiding gay bars. Bars were one of the few places of refuge for the LGBT community. And on June 28th, 1969, New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn in New York's Greenwich Village. What started as a raid became a riot as our community decided we had had enough. Within weeks, village residents organized into activist groups demanding the right to live openly regarding their sexual orientation without fear of being arrested. Now, church, does that situation sound familiar? In the Bible, we read about exactly that situation, where the church was persecuted, where Rome would raid and execute any Christians it found. And what was their crime? Telling the world that God is love. Boy, that sounds familiar. In 1970, a year after the uprising, the first gay pride marches took place in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. Within a few years, gay rights organizations were founded across the US and the world. Today, LGBT pride events are held annually worldwide in June to remember the Stonewall riots. But why pride? It sounds strange sitting in the pews. After all, pride is a sin. <laughs> it's debatable, but pride is a sin. Of course, this is a question for the straight people and for the young because every gay person, every person in our community knows the answer. Why are we proud to be gay? Because I am out and loud and proud. And if you're going to tell me that I am not human, that I am not worthy of basic human dignity, that I am an affront to dignity, you are going to have to look into my beautiful green eyes, look at the bravery in my heart and the pride on my face as I remember who God made me to be. And you're going to have to tell me that with a straight face. And you know, in my life, plenty of people have. I can't count the times people have yelled at me fucking faggot, and I of course yelled back damn straight. It takes pride to be a gay man in this world. It takes bravery to say to the world, I am who I am. I am who God made me to be. And this is why every LGBTQIA plus person knows why pride. Because it takes bravery just to exist in this world. July 1st marks one year since this congregation incorporated right at the end of Pride Month. Go figure. <laughs> 
We had a stated goal of being an LGBTQIA plus congregation, not simply being tolerant, not simply being inclusive, but being out and proud of who we are. We are out and proud that we are gay, that we are lesbian, we are queer, we are trans. We are out and proud that we are cis or white or people of color. We are in the majority some ways and in the minority others. We are as God made us and we are beautiful and we are wonderful and we are in many ways weird too because that is the way that God made us unique, everyone. So let the world see the bravery in our hearts and the pride in our eyes when they condemn us, when they condemn us for being who we are, whoever that is, whatever that means to you, because I know that you faced exactly what I have, that we are exactly who our creator made us to be. Now, when churches condemn us, and they do, that's why we're here. When they condemn us, they use seven passages. And I have another sermon online already about those seven passages. And you can look it up. I'll put it in the description with this one. But I'd like to offer you another seven passages. Seven passages that tell us that God made us who he wants us to be. Let's start in Psalm 27. Even if my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord would take me in. Because our God is a God of abandoned children. Our God is a God of orphans and widows and refugees. He states numerous times throughout the Old Testament and again in the New Testament that we are to look out for the widow, the orphan, and the refugee. Anyone who is marginalized in our society, you can read that conservatively and say, well, as some churches do, and say, well, what really is a widow? Well, what really is an orphan? And do aliens just mean people from outer space? How conservatively can we read this? I don't think God ever meant for us to read this conservatively. I think God meant for us to, to look to the fringes of our society and say, how can we bring these people in? In John, excuse me, I skipped one. In Psalm 34, it tells us in verse 17, the godly cry out and the Lord hears. He saves them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He delivers those who are discouraged. The godly face many dangers, but the Lord saves them from each one of them. He protects all their bones. Not one of them is broken. I was once told, if you lean on the Lord, the Lord will take care of you. You will have no troubles in this life. I wonder how the martyrs felt then, who had nothing but trouble in this life. I wonder how Jesus felt when they hung him on the cross. Didn't he have trouble in this life? The fact is, the godly will have trouble in this life, but God watches over each and every one of us. In John 15, Jesus tells us, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me first. The world, the majority, hate the LGBTQIA plus community. They hate anyone that isn't white and Protestant and American and American enough. Isn't that what Sarah Palin said, that, that there are two Americas? The real America? There are two Americas after all. There's the real America. There's the majority. And then there's all of us on the fringes. We're America too. We are the ones the world hates. 
because they hated Jesus. And don't you know that the, the real America hates Jesus? Because he was a Middle Eastern man, because he preached God is love, because he said, no matter who you are in this world, whether you're my people or you are other people, I'm going to reach out to you and you are now my people too. Guess what? There is no real America. In James 2, it says, For judgment is merciless. For one who has shown no mercy, excuse me, for the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. James reminds us, that even though there is something like a law, it was never given to us Christians. We live by mercy. We do not live by a moral code. We live by love. We live by mercy. We live by kindness. We live by patience. And against such things, there is no law. If we live by the virtues God has instilled in us, we will never see a law because mercy triumphs over judgment. When people say to me that I stand condemned before the Lord and people have, when they say to me that, that my existence is an affront to decency, I show them mercy. I show them kindness. I show them compassion. I show them what the Lord has instilled in me because mercy triumphs over judgment every time. If you read an obscure rule in the Bible and it doesn't feel right, if it seems like it goes against mercy and love, maybe that rule was meant to be broken. Live by mercy and not judgment. Psalm 118.22 says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the cornerstone, the stone that you measure the entire foundation against. Because if, if your cornerstone is level and every stone in your foundation is level to that cornerstone, your whole foundation will be level. We measure ourselves against the life of Christ. A life lived to proclaim to this world that God is love and that the kingdom he wants to establish is one in which everyone is included. Everyone is called to be family, not simply tolerated, not simply included. Oh, you can, you can sit on the back pews. We'll include you. No. We are called to be family in Christ. And that means that those people on the back pews, they deserve an honored seat at the table. Because we don't let family feel ashamed. Finally, in Isaiah 53, not finally, excuse me. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, it tells us, that he was despised and rejected by people, one who experienced pain and was acquainted with illness. People hid their faces from them. He was despised, and we considered him insignificant. Because this world does consider love insignificant. It doesn't produce anything profitable after all. You can't profit off of mercy. In fact, when we look at countries' GDP, the church doesn't factor into it because it produces nothing. And yet we keep people from falling into poverty. Our goal is charity. Our goal is love. We support one another. And that, although it's not measurable in our country's GDP, probably does more to safeguard it than anything else. We are this world's safety net. Finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, this is a disabled person is a passage I lean on all the time. 
It is what gave me the courage to go into ministry. Paul says, but he said to me, my grace is enough for you, my, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So then I will boast gladly about my weakness so that the power of Christ may reside in me. The fact is, God doesn't work through billionaires and CEOs. He doesn't work through people who have all the right degrees and the right upbringing that the world looks to and says, now that one, that one's going to be successful. That one's going to go far. God works through broken vessels. Vessels that can no longer hold water. Because when you look at the perfect clay jar and say, ah, this is perfect for hauling the water back home. Well, of course you expect it to succeed. It has no holes in it. When you look at a broken vessel, the one with the crack all the way down, and you go to the well and draw water into it, and it holds, you know that's an act of God. <laughs> you know that the power of Christ resides in those of us who have been rejected, who the world never said, ah, that one's going to go far. When we succeed, that is the power of God. That is a miracle. So I am proud to be a broken vessel. I am proud to be gay. I am proud to be disabled. I am proud that I am who God made me to be. Because when I hold water, when I pour forth the mercy and love of God, you know where I got that water. You know that I drew from the living well. So here are seven passages that tell you that God made you exactly who he wanted you to be. That God put you exactly in the world where you're meant to do the most good that you are who God wants you to be, that you are loved and that you are meant to be part of a family, part of a community who loves you. So accept no substitutes for the gospel. This is it. This is the good news. God loves you. And the church is learning too. Amen. 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 <laughs>